Welcome to day 26 of the 30 day my D for SOC analyst challenge, which is a challenge that I created for the sole purpose of helping aspiring SOC analysts obtain practical experience in 30 days. If you're interested in following along with this challenge, I would highly recommend that you pause the video and start from day one if you haven't done so already. By the end of this video, you'll learn how to investigate an SSH brute force alert and what are some of the things that you could look for. Let's get started. To begin investigating our SSH alerts that we created in previous days, what we want to do is head over to our hamburger icon and then scroll down and select alerts under our security tab. And wow, I have 195 alerts. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now yours is going to look a bit different. You might have more or less alerts. Let's just pick the first one from the top, which happened on August 14th. Now there are a couple of ways to investigate a brute force alert and Elastic does offer something pretty cool and those are called timelines. Now I won't go over timelines in this particular challenge but it is something that I would encourage you to spend some time and take a look at it. And timelines can be found on the left hand side right here. So if we click on timelines and then we can create a new timeline or we can use templates. So if I wanted to see all alerts involving a single user, I can click on that. And then it provides us with some information here. Go ahead and close that out. There is also other timelines such as generic process timeline. Now there aren't any results found here, but essentially what a timeline can help you with is your investigations. It'll provide you a lot of information at a glance to help you quickly determine if this particular rule slash alert is something that you should take a look more into. For example, looking at Elastic's documentation that says investigate events in timeline. Use timeline as your workspace for investigations and threat hunting. And if you take a look at the image here, there's a bunch going on, but it should provide you with a lot of information at a glance. Well, let's head back over to our alerts here and I'll select the first alert. So this one right here, I'll go ahead and expand that by clicking on the view details. And the description says, this rule detects failed authentications towards the account root. And the source IP is 194.50.16.5. And we can see that there was seven events within five minutes. Now, when investigating an SSH brute force alert, there are a couple of things that we should look for. Let me open up a notepad and I'll type in brute force. So one of the things is IP. We want to know, is this IP known to perform brute force activities. So this is more so for our own context. The next one is, were there any other users, any other users affected by this IP? And then were any of them successful? If so, what activity occurred after the successful login? So this right here is some of the investigator methodology that I go more into in my course, the My D for SOC Analyst course which if you are participating in the giveaway, you do have a chance of winning a free voucher. So with this, let's try and figure out what we can find out. Number one, is this IP known to perform brute force activity? Well, let's go ahead and copy out this IP address and let's just put it right here. And to find this out, I'll go ahead and use abuse IPDB. And wow, this IP was reported 1,816 times with a confidence abuse of 100%. That's interesting with the host name. What are you looking for? Scrolling down, we can see a lot of reports of failed password for root. So this tells me right here that this IP is known to perform brute force attacks. Another great resource that I love to use is called Gray Noise. Click on search for free and let's paste that in. So right here, we immediately see that this IP is indeed malicious and it also has some tags. So it's known to use ZMAP client, SSH brute forcer, to web crawler, and a TLS slash SSL crawler. Now, if you create an account, you can get some additional information, but this alone tells me enough. Is this IP known to perform brute force activity? Yes, it is. Now, the reason why I'm asking this question is to answer one thing, and that is, should I be worried? If I see an IP that is known to perform brute force attacks that are hitting my server, then I don't really care too much per se. But if there was another IP address that was clean and not reported for any suspicious activity, and it's performing this attack, that I am more interested in. Now, any other users affected by this IP? Well, let's go over to Kibana. And what I'll do is I'll open up a hamburger icon, click on discover, and let's just search up the IP address. 
I'll just copy this and paste it in here. I'll change the day to last 30 days. And within 30 days, we have 281 events. Taking a look at the question here, any other users affected by this IP? And if you recall in previous videos, we did use a field name called user.name. So if I click on that, we can see four distinct users. So one is root, one is Oracle, guest, and test. So answering the second question, are any other users affected by this IP? Yes, four. So I'll type in root, Oracle, guest, and test. The reason why I'm asking this particular question is to try and understand what did this IP do and who was it targeting? The next question here is, were any of them successful? This is a great question. So I'll type in and accepted. Now we do get zero results. And just to make sure I am querying for the right thing, I will go ahead and remove this. So typing in accepted, I get zero hits. Now I know for sure accepted is a keyword that will show up if there was a login that was successful. But what if I type in accepted with a capital A? Does capitalization matter? And it does. And this is why it's important to always double check your query and don't just think that everything works as expected. Because this right here is the beauty of tech. <laughs> now let's modify our query. I'll type in the 194 address and it should be saved here. So I'll click on that and capitalize my A, hit enter, and now nothing shows up. Within the last 30 days, we are good to go. So that means, were any of them successful? No. Why am I asking this question? Well, if there was a successful logon, then <laughs> I want to know what activity occurred after they logged in successfully. Did they go and download a shell script? Did they perform discovery commands? Did they perform persistence? Did they execute something malicious? Maybe run linpeas, which is quite common when looking for potential privilege escalations. And these are the answers that we want to obtain. So because none of them were successful, I would just say nothing, right? So that means this particular alert, I can go ahead and close it. Now, of course, this is just a demonstration. In a real world environment, you would go to your ticketing system, add in your notes and do all that good stuff. Make sure to always follow the process. And speaking of ticketing system, let's modify our rules to push our alerts into our ticketing system that we spun up. To do that, I'll click on rules on the left. Yeah, that's fine. Click on detection rules. And for our SSH brute force attempt, I'll click on that. Click on edit rule settings. Under actions, I'll click on webhook. And from here, I see my OS ticket that is automatically selected. For the action frequency, we can change it to for each alert or summary of alert. We can do per rule run, why not? It is going to create a bunch of tickets, but hey, we're having fun. And for the body, I'll be using the same test example that was provided by OS Ticket. I am going to remove the IP and attachments and just leave the message type, just like that. So from here, we have our ticket alert, and this is true, auto respond true, source is API, the name, angry user, the name, <laughs> I'm gonna change this to elastic. Email, we would add in our actual email address, but for now, let's just leave it as api at osticket.com. For the subject, instead of testing API, let's put this as our real name. And how do we do that? Well, I will remove testing API and click on this little button here, which says add variable. And here we can select a bunch of variables. I scroll down, is there a rule, rule name right here? Click on that for the phone. Again, in a production environment, if you have a phone, then that's where you put it. But since I don't, I'll just leave it as is. For the message, message content here. This is where you can start modifying your content. Please investigate the rule and then I'll put the rule name. And let's just test this for now. I'll click on save changes. All right, after a couple minutes, let's go over to our OS ticket and refresh this. And we do get two alerts. Awesome. So let's start from the bottom here. I'll click on that. And looking at the subject, it actually has our rule name, which is quite nice. Looking at the comment, it says, please investigate the rule and rule name. Perfect. Now we did see a lot of other options that we can select. So let's do that. So I'll click on edit rule settings, head over to actions. And I did see the context variable, which I am quite curious as to what that entails. 
Let's select investigation fields. What is this? I'll type in context dot investigation underscore fields. Click on save changes. And now we wait. So we got a new alert. I'll go ahead and click into that. And looking at our context investigation fields, I only see a source IP, but it doesn't really provide us with a source IP. Hmm. Interesting. So when looking at Elastic's documentation, specifically the alert notification placeholders, this would provide us with an idea as to what you should expect if you used some of the variables. So for example, context.alerts will show you an array of detected alerts, whereas context.rulefilters will show you the rule filters. And if we scroll down, we do have, let's say, state.signals underscore count. This will show us the number of alerts detected. I will leave this link down below as well. That way you can learn more about it. Now I am going to admit Elastic is not my strong suit and I couldn't unfortunately create the output that I wanted. So if you're watching and you have some time and you figure this out, please let me know how you did it. Essentially, whenever I'm outputting alerts to let's say a case management or even Slack, I love formatting it where it says alert, alert name, and then the source IP, for example, will show me the actual source IP. The user will show me the user and let's just say computer as well. And in this case, that is what I was trying to put here. Going back over to my detection rule under edit rule settings, actions in the body itself, I wanted to create something similar where it would show me, for example, the user and source IP. But by using these variables, I'm not quite sure how I could do that, to be honest. So if you can find that out, please do let me know and put that in the comment section below. But for now, let's go ahead and remove all of this and leave my please investigate the rule rule name. And let's add in a link actually, just to make everything nice and neat. Link and let's use rule.url. Now, if I highlight this, it says, this will be an empty string if the server.public base URL is not configured. What that means is that I will need to configure it. So let me go ahead and save this out first. And going into my Elk server, I'm going to type in nano slash Etsy slash Kibana and type in kibana.yaml. What we're looking for is the server.public base URL, which is this one right here. For the public base URL, I'll type in HTTP colon forward slash 216.128.176.197 on port 5601. Hold control X, Y to save and enter. The next thing to do is go ahead and restart our Kibana. So type in systemctl restart kibana.service. And then after a couple seconds, let's do systemctl status kibana.service. And it's active. Perfect. Let's head over to our web GUI and we're inside our SSH brute force rule. I'll click on edit rule settings and click on actions. Scrolling down, we no longer get the error that we saw earlier, which is good news. And let's go ahead and save changes just in case. Now, if we refresh our OS ticket, looking at a recent alert, I do see it as HTTP now. Perfect. Now it is kind of odd that it doesn't hyperlink everything, but that is okay. We can highlight it and then right click, go to that URL, and then it will drop you into the rule that triggered the alert. So if you scroll down, you can click on view details and it'll provide you with all of the information that is required to help you begin your investigation. When it comes to the ticketing system, you do want to follow your process, whatever the process may be. But one thing is for sure, you do want to assign the ticket to yourself. So click on assignee, Steven, my DFIR, working on ticket. That way, if you are working with other analysts, you aren't duplicating your efforts. At the bottom, once you've obtained some answers, you can then start putting it in here post it as a reply. That way, if anybody were to take a look, they can know exactly what you did and what you found. Finally, when the time comes, you can then close your ticket by clicking on the dropdown and selecting resolved. Post reply. Now here it says, unable to post this reply. Correct any errors below. So what this means is that we need to provide a reason as to why we're closing it. I can select a canned response, but I'll just say closing as test and post reply. And now our ticket is closed. We can hover the closed icon here and click on today. And then this is closed. So if I select that 
we could see the audit trail. Hopefully, by following along, you are now becoming more confident in your skills to investigate potential suspicious activity. To strengthen your knowledge and obtain additional practical experience, in the next video, we'll do another alert, but this time focusing on RDP. Thank you so much for watching and subscribe if you want to. Remember to stay curious and do things differently.